St. Benedict's Teaching on the Spiritual Life If St. Benedict thought, as the event showed, rightly thought, that he could eliminate from the monastic life the element of corporal austerity as it had been understood and practiced before his time, it goes without saying that he by no means supposed asceticism could be dispensed with. Asceticism, as we have seen, means training in the spiritual life, both in the negative aspect of purging from soul and character all that is sinful, imperfect, selfish, and in the positive aspect of cultivating, building up all that is good and holy. It thus embraces mortification and the practice of the virtues, and it is, in effect, that aiming at and tending to perfection that is one of the recognized obligation of the religious life in every form. It is the department of the spiritual life which has to do with ourselves and our own souls, and the process of purification that will make them such as may draw near to God. Though it is impossible to extract from the rule of St. Benedict's teaching on the spiritual life, he nowhere gives any scientific or ordered exposition of a general theory of its course, but such a theory is to be found in Cassian, and Cassian we know was St. Benedict's spiritual book of predilection. In two places in the rule he tells his monks to read Cassian, and the Index Scriptorum to my edition of the rule shows that the references to Cassian are more numerous and also more considerable than to any other author. And if the references be examined, it will appear that St. Benedict was familiar with Cassian's writings and was saturated with their thought and language in a greater measure than with any other save only the Holy Scriptures. So in giving Cassian's theory of the spiritual life, we may be sure we are giving the ideas practically accepted by St. Benedict. It is the 14th conference, that of Abbot Nesteros, on spiritual knowledge that we find a formal exposition of the course of the spiritual life. Bishop Gibson's translation in the Nicene and Post-Nicene Library is followed, the text being compressed. Quote, spiritual knowledge is twofold. First, practical, which is brought about by an improvement of morals and purification from faults. Secondly, which consists in the contemplation of things divine and the knowledge of the most sacred thoughts. Whoever would arrive at this theoretical contemplative knowledge must first pursue practical knowledge with all his might and main. For this practical knowledge can be acquired without the contemplative, but the contemplative cannot possibly be gained without the practical in vain does one strive for the vision of God who does not shun the stains of sin. This practical perfection depends on a double system, for its first method is to know the nature of all faults and the manner of their cure, its second to discover the order of the virtues, and form our mind by their perfection. For in what way will one, who has neither succeeded in understanding the nature of his own faults, nor tried to eradicate them, be able to gain an understanding of virtues, which is the second stage of practical training, or the mysteries of spiritual and heavenly things, which exists in the higher stage of contemplative knowledge. The practical life is distributed among many different professions and interests, for some make it their whole purpose to aim at the secrecy of the anchorite and to be joined to God by the silence of solitude. Some have given all their efforts and interests to the system of the cenobotic life and the care of the brethren. Some are pleased with the kindly service of the guest house and hospitality, as Macarius presided over the guest house in Alexandria, in such a way as to be considered inferior to none of those who aimed at the retirement of the desert. Some chose the care of the sick, others devote themselves to intercession for the afflicted and the oppressed or give themselves up to teaching or almsgiving to the poor. Wherefore, it is good and profitable for each one to endeavor with all his might and main to attain perfection in the work that has been begun, according to the line he has chosen as the grace which he has received. And while he praises and admires the virtues of others, not to swerve from his own line, which he has once for all chosen. For those who are not yet settled in the line which they have taken up are often, when they hear some praise for different pursuits and virtues, so stirred up by the praise of them that they try forthwith to imitate their methods, it is an impossibility for one and the same man to excel at once in all the good deeds enumerated above. In many ways, men advance towards God, 
and so each man should complete that one which he has once fixed upon, never changing the course or of his purpose, so that he may be perfect in whatever line of life his may be. Endeavor, with all eagerness to gain in the first place a thorough grasp of practical, that is, ethical discipline. For without this, theoretic contemplative purity cannot be obtained. End quote. As used in this passage, the actual life is quite different from the active life of St. Gregory and later writers, for it includes as one of its form the life of hermits. Any form of Christian life may afford the exercising ground for the practice of virtue that is required for Cassian's actual life. One form is the cenobotic life, and this is the form chosen by St. Benedict for his monks. Persevering in God's teaching until death in the monastery, we may by patience share in the sufferings of Christ. Cassian's teaching on the spiritual life is further illustrated in the first conference. Quote, The end of our profession indeed is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, but the immediate aim or goal is purity of heart, without which no one can gain that end. Fixing our gaze then steady on this goal, as if on a definite mark, let us direct our course as straight towards it as possible. Whatever can help to guide us to this object, purity of heart, we must follow with all our might. But whatever hinders us from it, we must shun as a dangerous and hurtful thing. 4. For this we do and endure all things. For this we make light of our kinsfolk, our country, honors, riches, the delights of this world, and all kinds of pleasures, namely, in order that we may retain a lasting purity of heart. And so, when this object is set before us, we shall always direct our actions and thoughts straight towards the attainment of it, and if it be not constantly fixed before our eyes, all our toils will be vain and useless and endured to no purpose. Everything should be done and sought after by us for the sake of this. For this we must seek, for solitude. For this we know that we ought to be submit to fastings, vigils, toils, bodily nakedness, reading, and all other virtues, that through them we may be enabled to prepare our heart and to keep it unharmed by all evil passions, and resting on these steps to mount to the perfection of charity. Those things which are of secondary importance, such as fastings, vigils, withdrawal from the world, meditation on scripture, we ought to practice with a view to our main object, purity of heart." Fastings, vigils, meditation on the scriptures, self-denial, and the abnegation of all possessions are not perfection, but aids to perfection, because the end of that science does not lie in these, but by means of these we arrive at the end. end quote. The following summary of the way up to perfection may also be cited. The beginning of salvation and of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. From the fear of the Lord arises salutary compunction. From compunction of heart springs renunciation, i.e. nakedness in contempt of all possessions. From nakedness is begotten humility. From humility, the mortification of desires. Through mortification of desires, all faults are expurtated and decay. By the driving out of faults, virtues shoot up and increase. By the budding of virtues, purity of heart is gained. By purity of heart, the perfection of the apostolic love is acquired. Institutes chapter 4, verse 43. With this background to St. Benedict's mind, we may come to his own teaching on interior asceticism and the spiritual life. He places asceticism primarily in the renunciation of self-will, and on this he is insistent, as uncompromising as in matters of corporal austerity he is indulgent. At the very outset, he says to those who would come to the monastic life under his guidance, that he addresses such as renounce their own wills. And in the course of the rule, the same idea is insisted on again and again. We are forbidden to do our own will. We must abandon it. We must hate it. We must not through love of our own will take pleasure in carrying out our own desires. No one in the monastery is to follow the will of his own heart, and it is not lawful for monks to have either their bodies or their wills as their own disposal. Finally, St. Benedict's very description of the cenobotical life is as follows. They do not live by their own free will, or obey their own desires and pleasures, but walk by another's judgment and command, and living in monasteries, 
desire that an abbot be over them. This renunciation of self-will translates itself into action into the three recognized vows of religion. It will express itself ready obedience to another's will and detachment and poverty, impurity of heart and chastity. Thus, it is the very root of self-discipline and the practice of virtue or asceticism in its highest acceptance. And by thus singling it out as the thing that above all matters, St. Benedict showed himself as the great religious genius he was. It is the denying oneself, and, as St. Gregory says, quote, It is less a thing to renounce what one has, but it is an exceeding great thing to renounce what one is. It is to be noticed that he does not say that we are to mortify, to kill our own will, so as to become merely indifferent. This idea is often inculcated by the Egyptian monks and by later religious legislators. It is remarkable that though the words mortificare and mortificatio are common in Cassian, they are nowhere used by St. Benedict. He takes for granted that self-will is always alive in us, as of course it is, and so the most he tells us is to hate it. Could it be once for all destroyed, we should be deprived of the principal means of ascetical discipline. And it is a means that can constantly be used at every moment in things small and great, at every call of duty, when up against any rule and any trouble, trial, temptation, in all our dealings with others, everywhere self comes in, everywhere is their self-will to be combated and conquered. It is the overcoming of self, the elimination of selfishness, it is, in short, that self-denial that is the root of the spiritual life. If anyone wished to come after me, let him deny himself. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 26, verse 24. And St. Benedict relied on this all-embracing spiritual mortification to effect in his monks that purifying of spirit that is the object of asceticism. When we look at the positive side of asceticism, Cassian's second part of the actual life, the training in virtue, we find that St. Benedict's formal teaching on the spiritual life is contained in The Instruments of Good Works and On Humility. We refer once for all to Abbot de Laate's excellent and practical commentary on these two chapters, where their teaching is clearly and solidly brought out. Only certain aspects will be noted here. The instruments are 75 spiritual and moral precepts of miscellaneous character. They include the Ten Commandments and the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, and of the others, some are derived from Scripture, and a few from other sources, but most have not been traced to any source. The instruments afford a wide and varied field of ascetical training, and St. Benedict gives them to his monks as the instruments or tools of the spiritual art, which are to be used incessantly, day and night, in the workshop of the monastery. And so the declaration of the English congregation direct this chapter often to be read and meditated upon, so that the precepts inculcated in it may always be uh, for us the norm of our life. It is worthy of note that in St. Benedict's instruments there is nothing monastic or religious in the technical sense. They are all mere Christianity, elementary morality, fundamental religion. But any formal presentation by St. Benedict of a theory of the spiritual life must be sought in the greater chapter on humility, which has become a classic in ascetical literature. There is no question of giving any set commentary here, but only the barest indication of the doctrine. Abbot Delate's commentary may again be referred to, and also the masterly chapter on humility in Father Baker's Sancta Sophia, which seems to bring out the deepest meaning of St. Benedict's teaching, though humility is the word used throughout by St. Benedict, at the beginning it is equated with discipline, which shows that under the term humility is included all that is meant by self-discipline or asceticism. As is well known, St. Benedict marks 12 degrees of humility, The fourth to eleventh are in large measure suggested by Cassian, but the first three and the last are St. Benedict's own. The first degree embraces the most fundamental truths of religion, which must pervade our minds at all times and be the groundwork of the spiritual life in us, the fear of God and mindfulness of his commandments, the sense that we are always in God's presence, and that all our thoughts and actions lie open to his sight, and the realization that he is at all times present with us. 
St. Thomas sums up this degree as reverence to God and declares that it is the root of humility. Humility, indeed, fundamentally is the realization of the truth as regards God, ourselves, and our relation to Him, and the acting on such realization. The next two degrees are concerned with renunciation of self-will and obedience, that we love not our own wills and delight not in fulfilling our own desires, and that for God's love we subject ourselves with all obedience to our superior, and then follow four degrees of extreme difficulty that takes us to the heights of self-conquest, that if in obedience things hard and distasteful, or even what injures soever, are laid upon us, our conscience do silently embrace them, and enduring them do neither grow weary nor fall away. Let the monk hide not from his abbot in humble confession his evil thoughts and secret actions, i.e., not as a matter of sacramental confession, that the monk be contented with the meanest and the worst of everything, and whatever be enjoined him, judge himself a bad and worthless workman, that not only with his tongue does he pronounce himself, but also in the inmost feeling of his heart, believe himself lower and viler than all others. This last might seem impossible, were it not that in such cases as St. Teresa's and others, we have example of the holiest souls penetrated by an absolute and sincere conviction that they were the most unworthy and abject of creatures. The last five degrees are concerned with the effects of humility on conduct and demeanor. It will be seen that St. Benedict's conception of humility is much wider and deeper than the usual connotation of the word being the equivalent, as he makes it, of discipline, or training in the spiritual life, so that here we have his full doctrine of asceticism, the exercises he relied on for their formation and growth of his monks in holiness. It is nothing short of renunciation in a heroic degree. Yet St. Benedict is not framing any mere theoretical or academic scheme of virtue. He intends his monks to practice all these degrees of humility, for he says, if we wish, and he manifestly takes for granted that we do, to attain not merely to humility, not merely to a high kind of humility, but to the summit of the highest humility, then must these rungs of the ladder be mounted. And at the end he declares, when all these degrees of humility have been climbed, the monk will straightway come to that perfect love of God which casteth out fear. The Benedictine monk must therefore not look on the difficult degrees as heights out of reach, and mere ideals not intended for him. On the contrary, he is required to work seriously all his life as the acquirement of all the degrees of humility, even the highest and hardest. And he has St. Benedict's assurance, an assurance amply vouched for by history, that this spiritual asceticism will do for him as much as the corporal austerities of the older and also of newer monasticism, and will bring him surely to that love of God is the one ultimate object of the monastic life. It will have been noticed that the renunciation St. Benedict calls for always comes back, one way or another, to the renunciation of the will. It is always one's own will that has to be renounced. Nothing is said of renunciation of the affections, and yet this principle of the mortification of the affections under the name of detachment plays a prominent role in modern schools of asceticism and spirituality, and especially in the case of those devoted to the religious life. But such teaching has found its place in asceticism from the beginning, and conspicuously among the monks of Egypt. Probably the great apostle of detachment is the Carmelite mystic St. John of the Cross, the friend of St. Teresa, who, in the ascent of Mount Carmel, pursues the matter with scientific method and unrelenting logic through each faculty of the mind, each power of the soul, urging that for the spiritual man, no joy, no pleasure in anything, whether natural or spiritual, is admissible, there being nothing in which a man may rejoice except in serving God. Such sentences as the following abound, quote, The spiritual Christian ought to suppress all joy in created things because it is offensive in the sight of God. And he shrinks from no deductions. It is vanity for wife and husband to rejoice in marriage or to desire children, for they know not if they shall be servants of God. End quote. Probably no other Christian teacher has pushed the doctrine of detachment to a limit so extreme but others do teach a similar theory. For instance, Father Augustine Baker, 
though in the matter of bodily mortification most moderate, in the matter of affections propounds a view of detachment that is a hard saying. The duty of a Christian, much more of a soul that aspires to perfection, is to love nothing at all but God, or in order to Him, that is, as a means and instrument to beget and increase His divine love in our souls. All adhesion to creatures by affection, whether such affection be great or small, is accordingly sinful, more or less, so that, if being deprived of any one thing or persons whatsoever, or being pained by anything, we find a trouble and sorrow in our minds for the loss of suffering of the thing itself, such trouble, in what degree soever, argues that our affection was sinful. Not only because the affection was excessive, but because it was an affection, the object whereof was not God. He explains indeed that he means an affection seated in the superior soul or rational will, not one confined to the sensitive nature, and sums up, to the superior will all things but God must be indifferent as in and for themselves, and only to be loved as they are serviceable to the spirit. Most modern writers would tone down such doctrine and recognize the lawfulness and goodness of the primary natural affections, but in matters of friendship an extreme rigor prevails, especially in the various forms of religious life, so that what is demanded is not so much the regulation and sanctification of the affections as their suppression. Precepts and examples of an extreme detachment are frequent among Egyptian monks, especially in regards to the family relationships and affections. And here it is possible to produce another antithesis, like those of the preceding chapter, illustrating the difference between St. Benedict's ideas and those prevalent in Egypt. Palladius relates of Abbot Prior of Nitria that on leaving his father's house as a young man in order to become a monk, he made a vow never again to see any of his family. And after fifty years, his old sister became possessed with a longing to see him, and begged the bishop to use his influence to make him come out of the desert and visit her. So Pyer went to her house, and standing outside, shut his eyes and called to her that he was there, and bade her come out and look at him. And she could not persuade him to enter the house, but praying on the threshold, which cl with closed eyes, he departed again to the desert. What a contrast is this to St. Benedict's treatment of his sister Scholastica. Every year she came to a house near, the monastery, and they used to spend the day together till nightfall, and on her death Benedict had her body brought and laid in the grave prepared for himself, so that, as their minds were always one in God, no, their bodies were not separated in the grave. When we examine the rule, we find no exhortation to renunciation of the affections among either the instruments of good works or the degrees of humility. St. Benedict warns the abbot must not love one more than another, except him whom he finds better in good actions and obedience. He is to love his monks, and to try to win their affections, and the monks in turn should love their abbot with sincere and humble love. The elder monks are to love the younger, and the younger to obey the elder with all charity, and all are to cherish fraternal charity with love chastely. There is no ground for supposing that in these passages the words deligare amare do not bear their real meaning of love. On the contrary, they suggest that the great natural family relations and affections were intended by St. Benedict to hold sway in his spiritual family. The love of father for sons sway in his spiritual family. The love of father for sons and son for father and brothers for one another after the example of the mutual love of Benedict and Scholastica. There is no sure interpretation of the spirit of a religious rule than the practice of the saints who lived under it. St. Bernard's theory of natural affection and detachment stands out clear in the lament on the death of his own brother, Gerard, a monk with him at Clairvaux. Quote St. Bernard, My very bowels are torn away, and it is said to me, Do not feel any pain. But I do feel pain, and that in spite of myself. I have not the insensibility of a stone, nor is my flesh of bronze. I have feeling assuredly, and sharp pain, and my trouble is ever in my sight. I have confessed my great affliction, and denied it not. Someone has called this carnal. I do not deny that it is human, just as I do not deny that I am a man. If that does not suffice, then I shall not deny that it is carnal. Nevertheless, I do not desire to oppose at all the decrees of the Holy One. 
it is reasonable to declare that I call in question the sentence because I feel the penalty keenly? To feel is human, but to repine would be impious. It is human, I repeat, and unavoidable that we should not be indifferent to those who are our friends, that we should enjoy their presence and lament it being taken from us. Social intercourse, particularly among friends, will not be tedious. The reluctance to separate, and the pain which is felt by each when separated, shows plainly the effect that their mutual affection has had upon those who live together. St. Bernard clearly does not come up to the standard of detachment required by St. John of the Cross and Father Baker, and the above, be it noted, was spoken to his monks. In the introduction to The Monks of the Lest, Montalembert speaks on the subject of friendship in the cloister. He brings forward not only from St. Bernard, but from St. Anselm and many other great figures in Benedictine history, passages, some of a southern warmth of expression, which show how real how devoted, how truly human were the affections they did not hesitate to entertain and give scope to. Yet St. Bernard and St. Anselm were saints and stound out as strong men in an age when men were strong. This shows that the kind of detachment called for by St. John of the Cross and many modern spiritual writers is at any rate not necessary for sanctity. At most, it is only one kind of holiness. There is another to be obtained without it, which lies not in the suppression, but in the due regulation and sanctification of affections. And the example of the great Benedictine saints, including St. Benedict himself, the indications of the rule and the analogies of St. Benedict's attitude to bodily austerities, which is one of temperance, not total abstinence, all lead to the conclusion that the latter is the authentic Benedictine idea of detachment. Both views can find support in the Gospels. There are utterances of our Lord that seem to call for detachment, even the most rigorous. On the other hand, we are allowed to see that he had his human friendships and gave scope to his human affections. And the appeal to the example of our Lord brings us to the final touchstone of the spiritual life, which in all its forms must be for Christians, a following of Christ. This St. Benedict knew well, and so his rule begins with Christ, ever dwells on Christ, and ends with him. The aspirant to the monastic life is addressed as one going to serve as a soldier of Christ. The monk it is by faith to see Christ in all, in the abbot, in the guests, in the poor, in the sick. In self-denial he follows Christ. In obedience he imitates him. By patience he shares his sufferings. By love of him, Will he come to perfect charity? He is to place nothing before the love of Christ, nor deem anything dearer to him than Christ. And finally, the last words of the rule proper, for the final chapter is an appendix, are that he is to prefer nothing whatsoever to Christ. And this is the sum of St. Benedict's teaching on the spiritual life. This has been a production of Alleluia Audiobooks, For more free Catholic audiobooks, please visit us at alleluiaaudiobooks.com. If you would like to make a copy of this CD to give to your friends or family, please feel free to do so, but we do ask that you do not alter the original audio. Thank you, and God bless. St. Benedict, pray for us.